Good evening, everyone. John is working the crowd, I think. Oh, not at all. Uh, my name is Fred Oswald. I'm a professor of psychology and acting director of Scientia. You can tell from my, my acting skills. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the annual Bachner Lecture. Uh, Rice welcomes you, Scientia welcomes you. Um, I'm sure uh, that Bachner, Solomon Bachner himself would welcome you if he were, if he were here. Uh, he was the founder of Scientia. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, John Maeda. Um, John is design partner at Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers, where he works with their entrepreneurs and portfolio companies to accelerate the impact of design in the high technology industry. He served as 16th president of Rhode Island School of Design from 2008 to 2013, and he previously spent 13 years at MIT's Media Lab as professor and head of research. Maida chairs the eBay Design Advisory Council, serves on the boards of Sonos and Whedon and Kennedy, and is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on New Growth Models. His books include, but are not limited to, The Laws of Simplicity, Creative Code, and Redesigning Leadership, which expands on his Twitter feed, at John Maeda, one of Time Magazine's 140 best Twitter feeds. He has received a variety of international awards for his creative work, including induction to the Art Directors Club Hall of Fame and the White House's National Design Award. So please help me welcome John Maeda. It's a real thrill to have him here. And uh, um, let's uh, give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For that warm intro. Am I talking louder? Do I sound louder? Yeah. I do. Okay, good. Thank you for the. Okay, let's see here. Is that loud? Hello. Oh, wow. That's louder. Thanks. Okay, good. All right, well, first of all, I was sitting back over there and getting data. I wasn't working in the crowd. <laughs> I have nothing to gain from working in the crowd. It's okay. It's America. And um, I was talking to Mike over there, and Mike asked me, Am I nervous? to talk in front of you. Not at all, because you can't hurt me. <laughs> and I don't owe you any money, I'm not gonna, but it's okay. So, and I know you're here because you were curious. You could have watched that show that you've been waiting to watch. You could have had that dinner, you could have gone on that run, or whatever you chose to come here. So, I think you're hoping I won't mess up your evening. But still, I don't really care, it's okay. Uh, because I really had, I had the best time today. I had the chance to sit in a private room with some of your faculty members. And I have to say that it was one of the most stimulating conversations I've had in a long while. And I felt that if all of you get that chance to sit with professors like that, life can't be that bad, because it was good for me. And uh, I wrote down this thing that, uh, Professor Brandt had said during dinner, and it was uh, really nice. It was, uh, it was the music is an open frontier, not a closed system. It's total Jean-Luc Picardish. I was feeling good about that. Um, I could feel this sense of multidisciplinarity, camaraderie, most importantly, curiosity which I remember is why I really enjoyed being a professor at MIT uh, for over 10 years, which is longer than five. Um, uh, usually, if you're tenured, you stay there forever. That's the whole business model. You work really hard for seven years or so, and you're lucky to get to stay. And I, 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 I had that moment, and uh, I kind of escaped from that world. Um, I've still been trying to understand it, really. Uh, but I know that uh, it has helped me understand things that I didn't know. First thing I didn't know is how important it is to have people in the front row. Now, if you are students, you are hiding from the professor. I am not a professor. I cannot hurt you. I cannot, they wouldn't hurt you here, I know that. But I can't give you a worse grade. So I have four chairs here, two here and one. One over here. Could uh, students come down? Let's see. Can four come down? Can you start? Can you, can you come down? I'll explain why. There's a mat. Read it. Thank you very much, Casey. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maroon person. Thank you, great person and great person. There we go. 
have already improved the quality of this tonight's evening. Now I must add three more. Three more, come down. Three more, come down. One, very good, white shirt. Micah, thank you. Barry, oh, you guys, oh, it's like Christmas. It's like that, you know, George, whatever thing, the, the, the bell's ringing. Thank you. Micah, come on over, look closer. No, over here. They won't hurt you. Maybe they'll give you grades or something, I'm not sure. But right there, and is it okay? Is that right there? Perfect, thank you. Please sit right over here, thank you. Is that okay? I'll have it right here, right here. I will give it to you. Thank you. Um, I will explain why, and thank you for the entrustment. Isn't this a trusting place? Wow, that's awesome. Um, there's a reason why, and um, I didn't realize this for a long time, but first of all, uh, I, do you know Richard Saul Werman? Have you heard of him? He's the founder of TED. If you've heard of TED, right? Like TED, like life-changing, whatever kind of thing, you know? Um, TED was founded by a guy <laughs> named Richard Saul Werman. Not just a guy, by the way. Kind of this, like, force of nature man, this sort of like glob-like creature that could walk around naked and you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't like to see it. But uh, someone who's all personality and loves design, loves entertainment, loves technology. Uh, he was so in love with this that he went to what was called the uh, IDCA. There was, used to be something called the International Design Conference at Aspen. It's a famous conference. It ran for 50 years in Aspen. It closed shop because it, was, it went bankrupt, poorly managed. But it was founded uh, by uh, the, uh, the, the, the person, uh, the Papke family, uh, Container Corporation of America. You may know it. Uh, uh, I used to grow up in, I grew up in a tofu store in Chinatown in Seattle. And I would see Container Corp boxes all the time. Well, the Papke family made uh, a fortune around this. And they set up this conference to bring together uh, industrialists and art together in Aspen. And that was the birth of the IDCA. Uh, if you haven't uh, been there, it's because it's kind of hard to get to Aspen. It's super expensive. Uh, but there's a whole uh, beautiful campus there that was uh, developed by Herbert Beyer uh, as a kind of Bauhausian kind of example. So as an architect, you're going to love it. As someone who loves uh, the mountains, it's a really special place. But Richard Saul Werman would go there every year, and after a while, he didn't like it. He thought that he could build a better conference. So he went and made TED. Isn't that kind of cool? You go in every year and you say, ah, F it. I don't really like this conference. I'm making my own. And so he formed this conference in Monterey, California. And uh, it was really just his friends. Friends like Quincy Jones and like all these people who in the day were really amazing people. And he felt that colleges, universities had difficulties going across. Industry had difficulty going across. And so he like we'd make one place where everyone would come together across things. And that was the old TED. Uh, that was the idea behind it. It was invitation only. It was a very small group. Anyways, um, maybe you know TED.com. That's big. Uh, Richard sold the conference uh, to the person who founded Business 2.0. It is a huge business now. It's gigantic. It's very expensive. Um, but it came from one man's vision, Richard Saul Werman. So I've always, I always go uh, visit him. He's kind of like the architect in The Matrix. This is a mysterious man. You visit his house. He's a bit disturbing. Does he have emotion? Is he going to hurt you kind of thing? And um, Richard, you know, uh, I'd seen him speak so many times. And Richard has a reputation for being an a-hole. You know what that means. As I insert some letters there. Um, at least some like, oh my gosh, I can't stand him. He's such a, you know, a-hole. Like, oh my gosh, can't stand him. And um, Richard, but Richard would always, because he'd always do this one thing where he would ask everyone to come into the front, and, like fill the front. I always thought this was such an obnoxious thing to do. I'm just sitting there. And this guy in the front, he isn't paying me to come down. I don't want to listen. This is America. I sit where I want to sit, right? And I thought, what an obnoxious thing to do. And many years I watched this. And um, uh, I remember I gave many talks. And I gave a talk in Los Angeles last year where it was like a long theater. And it was a night of some sports game. 
So not a lot of people showed up. You know, it wasn't filled up, you know, kind of thing. And so what happened is I had people all the way to the back, you know, and I couldn't see. And the people in the front all scattered about. And I thought to myself, it's America. I am not going to ask people to rearrange. And because of it, I gave the worst talk I've ever given, absolutely ever given. And I asked my assistant, Marina, who's a performer, said, well, of course it was a bad talk. It's because you couldn't talk to the people. So thank you for being people who can be here, because I can get a better sense of what I'm talking about uh, and perhaps not waste all of your time as much. So that's the story behind that. So thank you for you bold people for entering the front row. Thank you, Mike, I see. You started this, so there you go. Long introduction to the Design and Tech Report. This launched just yesterday. And I have to say that yesterday was a really important moment for me because I was searching for how to do this thing that you're going to see, which was, I guess, in the Star Wars parlance, restore order to the force. I was trying to figure this out for multiple years, and it was great to get to actually make this uh, report. Um, I could tell because the moment I finished it, I could suddenly couldn't walk anymore because, have a seat, go ahead. Sit, sit in the front, sit in the, it's right here, right here. Right here. Oh, come, 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 right here, right there, right there. Right there. Okay, good, 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 thanks, thanks, thank you. Um, I was like dog tired, my body couldn't move. I could barely walk back to the hotel. It was such an awesome feeling because I knew I used all my energy to create this report. Um, Someone says to me, well, it's just a presentation. It's just a slide deck. Who cares? Well, I have to say, I learned over the years that I could make books, I could have exhibitions, I could do things in the public, share information. But then I realized that this whole new world is about sharing information in a different way. So I had to kind of like hit myself with a spaghetti noodle and say, maybe I shouldn't publish a book. Maybe I'll make this presentation. So I put all my energy into it, because you know, the whole point of a book is the point to finish. It's the punishment of finishing it. You can't touch it anymore. It's got to be perfect. You get only one chance. It's like, it's like anyone making an album. You're finished. So it's finished. And I give it to you in this finished date, which I'm excited about, which uh, talks to uh, multiple themes. And this is now available on the internet since yesterday. And it touches upon a variety of topics, everything from data in, on investing and in designer-led type of things. It speaks to the psychology of leaders in technology and design. It speaks to why design is becoming valuable in Silicon Valley. And so it's a kind of attempt to decode a lot of factors that I didn't understand. And I hope it'll be useful to you as well and to others who you know who are in the industry who are trying to figure out what is happening. So part one is the data. And I have to say, this is the fifth time I made this deck in the last three months. And to move the data to the front was torture. Because I wanted to put the data at the end. Because it's a story, right? Oh, it was a torture but it's in the front. Here we go. So um, I became aware of something in 2013, and that is that I have a friend named Maria Giudice. She has a uh, studio in the Bay Area, roughly 90-person design firm. The news broke in 2013 that it was acquired by Facebook. By Facebook. Surprising, because when design firms get acquired, they get acquired by holding companies. I'm sure you've heard of WPP or Omnicon. They're growing their media sort of footprint. This is a tech company <laughs> acquiring a design firm. It turns out that in my research, a lot of design firms have been acquired, most notably Frog Design. I think maybe you may have heard of it. It's kind of like IDO. It was acquired by Flextronics, and that was in years past. And what was notable, and looking at the data 
is a lot of companies have acquired design firms. Accenture acquired Fjord, Capital One acquired Adaptive Path, Google acquired Gecko Design, Facebook acquired another design agency. Why is this interesting? It's interesting because companies are acquiring design firms. Never happened before. Question is, why is that? It's because we're in a transition phase. Because some of you are my age, similar age. Do you remember when the computer came out and it could do nothing? Do you remember that? You buy a computer, you bring it home. What does it do? Uh, nothing. You know, you, uh, you type something in, it says wrong. Syntax error, you're wrong. <laughs> You know, there was no internet, there was no software, you remember that, and it was like useless, and it cost a few thousand dollars. And it was like, well, why do you have it? Well, it's the future. Um, and then over time, you had software evolved. Over time, you had the network, you had CD-ROM, you had the network again, came back faster, you know. And we loved technology. We meaning the nerds or the people in research. We loved computers, right? DSP, Professor Burroughs, right? DSP, I like, gotta get a better computer. It's only 100 megahertz, gotta get the 120. It's only 120, gotta get the 150. It's only 150, gotta get the Pro 150. Remember that? Every year, because of Moore's Law, the doubling of transistors every 18 months, not a physical law, mind you, but a kind of guideline that the industry used to compete around. When I studied Moore's Law, the Wikipedia entry at least, it has a list of all the transistor counts. <laughs> and <laughs> see, I'm part of your generation. Um, the transistor counts of chips, everywhere from the 6502, the Z80, 8086, you know, it went on and on. And I had this moment where it mentioned in 1989, the Texas Instruments List machine chip, the Hummingbird chip, in 1989. I was a summer intern at TI. I used to work in BLSI, uh, semiconductor device physics. Uh, I was a spice modeler, and not a spice girl. Spice, you guys know what spice is, but it had nothing to do with that. Spice. And I worked on that chip. And that was the 800,000 transistor chip, which at the time was unimaginable. We had to like dig into silicon to like create more surface area. It was unbelievable. Whereas if we look at 2015, the you know, transistor counts are as high as billions, two billion, three billion, right? So but I remember that moment. And it's been just leaping and vaulting every year. And so the solution for anything has always been more tech. And furthermore, we wanted a faster CPU, more memory. Remember when you would buy something? You'd, if you were at the at cutting edge, you'd buy the thing with the most memory, the most CPU. But a few years ago, it began, this Moore's Law thing stopped working as well. Did you notice that? Like, you don't need five terabytes on your phone for all your photos and images. You know, photos and sounds, maybe I'll buy the middle one. Maybe I'll buy the cheapest one because I don't need all that memory. That is a new thing. It's happened, right? You're nodding, it's happened. It's kind of weird. It used to be so easy to buy technology, you would just buy the better. Remember the digital cameras would have those stickers on them? Like 12,000 megapixels or something, like, you know? <laughs> eight night visions and like three whatever. Like, oh my gosh, it's amazing, gotta buy it. Technology was amazing. It's why we bought it. It's the reason we bought it. It was an easy way to choose. But what's happened is that is no longer the easy way to choose. That's the old thinking has moved to new thinking. And when I was president of RISD, I had the great fortune of knowing two alumni, alumni Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia. They are the co-founders of Airbnb, which I think some of you may know. Um, but Brian, I remember meeting them back when they were in their, uh, they were literally in their apartment in San Francisco three people trying to get money from investors and nobody would give them money. Brian's quote is saying, being designers, they thought we were people that worked for people that ran companies. And so the idea to go to a venture capital firm as a designer was crazy. 
You had to be a Stanford MBA or PhD or even a master or even an undergrad. That was okay. You came from design school, art school, not okay. Uh, but that changed. And I've been examining that. And this chart, again, you can see the high res versions of this because this uh, screen technology has been showing things too precisely. But that's 2005. Is this a laser? There we go. 2005, 2006, 2007. So uh, these are two designer co founded companies Flickr, Android, YouTube, Vimeo. YouTube was acquired by Google for $1.65 billion, co founded by a designer. And there were no other companies acquired. It was a dry spell. But 2009 was the inflection point. What happened was there was a company called Mint that was acquired by Intuit. And that was the moment where everything changed. Because Mint was Web 2.0. It was designed for mobile on top of that. It was designed in a category most people would never want to touch, but everyone needs, you know, your wallet. And after 2009, these are all the companies that are co-founded by designers, uh, and they're all bringing a mobile-centric view of the world. Companies like Instagram, acquired by Facebook for $1 million, $1 billion. And those are all co-founded by designers, 27 of them. And actually, this number is incorrect. There's actually more in the discoveries in the last few days. Why is this important? It kind of validates that we're living in a time when designers can co-found companies that have value in the business landscape. <coughs> and because I'm in venture capital now, I have access to all these databases that aren't at the library. So I can look at all these, you know, and I've used up all the Kleiner Perkins like, you know, credits, you know, so I got in trouble a little bit. But I was like, you know, like looking up the database, and I found that in the top 25 cumulatively invested startups, with a recent raise, top 25, five of them are designer co-founded. Uh, Fab.com, Pinterest, Airbnb, uh, Vice Media, and Lynda.com. That's five out of 25, which is a pretty huge number. It means that venture capital is trusting these creative enterprises to grow, to expand, which is quite amazing. I was surprised to see this number. On top of that, in January of last year, I became a design partner at Kleiner Perkins. People ask me, what does that mean? I'm still figuring it out. But it has that kind of uh, uh, agility in this position to define it and to own it. And Silicon Valley has this road called Sand Hill Road. It glistens with gold, apparently. Um, and uh, so I was the first design partner on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley in January. But after January, uh, what's happened is three more VC firms have brought on design leaders, and three more have joined outside of Sand Hill Road. And it's important to note that these people are not being retained to design logos or pretty pictures. You know, people ask me, so do you design logos all the time? Like, I, I draw the logo, I draw the logo on my head. Anyways, uh, logos, no logos. Um, um, they're all looking for how to leverage design in some strategic way to impact their business objectives. And so I work with uh, many companies uh, across different kinds of industries to facilitate that, uh, different stages of development as well. And and so if you look at the numbers, they're fairly simple. Uh, 27 startups co-founded by designers, 10 agencies acquired in the last four years. You have five startups co-founded by designers. And if you just add up the money they've raised, $2.75 billion. Uh, and six VC firms have brought on design people uh, to augment their capabilities as a VC firm. So if you project forward, um, you can imagine simple things, more M&A activity, more design-led startups can now access capital in an easier way. Before, the, in Brian Chesky's era, it was impossible. Now it's more possible. And furthermore, design and VC isn't about pretty. It's about relevance. And so I'm always asking that question, you know, how is this relevant? Does it work? Versus I like it. Like I, this, I like word, I like it. What does that mean? I like it, you know? Does it work? That's the question that we ask. 
Now, I note that it isn't easy all the time. People do ask me, what color do I like? Blue. Um, <laughs> so that's section one, data. And these are all available online to share, by the way. So number two, uh, a few thoughts about design, tech, and business. Let me see here. So uh, if you think about the way design and tech company would work, it's a tech company. So what does a tech company make? Technology. So you make the technology, and you're really tired. Like, oh my gosh, just made it. Now you want to ship it. So you add design at the very end. You kind of sprinkle it on, or you spray it on, you know? <laughs> well, it makes sense, right, from a cost perspective. It's like that technology costs a lot of money to make. And you're going to I'm gonna pay for some design. I'm going to pay for design and put it at the end, spray it on, you know? But for products like Nest, the reason why they're so good is design is baked in from the beginning. It isn't uh, after, uh, afterthought. And so what happens is the problem with this kind of design, of course, from a CFO's view, is that's expensive. You mean I got to put more put designers on this project throughout? <coughs> Let's just put it at the end. That's, so much, that's how we do it, right? It's cheaper that way. But what's happening is that design is moving from a cost to more of an investment. I call this wrapper style, DE dollar sign design. Uh, it isn't something you're having to pay for. It's something you actually need to invest in in product development from the beginning to mitigate risk around a product nobody wants. This is also Euro compliant, this, this symbol. So, <laughs> so please use it. Yeah. Um, and so people ask me a lot now, well, design is the most important thing, isn't it? I tell them, no, it's not the most important thing. You know, design is a partner in the process to a great technology product. Number one, you need great business thinking. If people can't afford it, can't get it, then who cares if the design is good? If it has to work, if it doesn't turn on all the time, if it doesn't work with 30 people versus 10 people, you're not going to want it. Design is a partner in that process of ensuring that it is a great experience. But it is not the most important factor. It is a factor that was missing in the technology product development process. It was sprayed on at the end. Now we're talking about moving it in the beginning. When everyone talks about design, you cannot help. I was just talking to a Wired reporter on the way here. And she was saying, yeah, when we think of like design and tech, what do you think? Apple, right? <laughs> Apple, of course, Apple. And what else? Apple. <laughs> you know? And, it, and, and so people think that Apple has this like force shield, you know, around like only it can do these things and, you know, fell from the heavens literally and it's like happening. So, and do you remember the Apple MacBook unibody? Well, you remember the unibody? It was aluminum, aluminum, like, a, you know, like, whoa, you know, it's, it was, how, did, how was it made? You know, that's impossible to make. You know, it was carved out of aluminum block. And I'm not sure if you know uh, this thing here. The only way to make that one part was to machine it from a single piece of aluminum. Do you hear Johnny I? Did you hear him? You gotta hear him again. There we go. He's so important to hear. And the only way to make that one part was to machine it from a single piece of aluminium. Did you hear him? Did you read that piece by Rob Walker, how Johnny Ive is the greatest infomercial salesman in the world? Right? And you want it. Made out of aluminium. You know, <laughs> mill to, you know, the T microns and whatever, like, oh my gosh, I have to have it, right? <laughs> so, when you think about, he's a great guy, by the way, not making fun of him, maybe kind of a little bit, uh, but this idea of making a MacBook, brilliant design, you know, it's like in a MoMA's collection, it's amazing design, but the real story behind the MacBook 
is the fact that Apple locked down the CNC milling machines to produce the set scale, locked down special lasers to cut the holes for the breathing LED. You know, and for the iPad, Tim Cook went to Australia and locked down the aluminum supply to control the price. Why is this important? It's important because 15 years ago, Apple designed things all the time. You just couldn't afford them, and they weren't of a good build quality. Apple can now make things that are desirable, they are also affordable, and they can make it with enough margins to be hugely profitable to reinvest it in interesting products. And so, again, it's design, business thinking, and engineering working in tandem. Design is just one part of the story. And as an example that shows you that this is not a new idea, <coughs> I looked into history and really enjoyed this chair story. This is the Thonet number 14 chair designed by Michael Thonet. It is informally called the Vienna Coffee House chair. If you've ever been to Paris and sat at one of the coffee shops, this is the chair you sit in. Michael Thonet was an Austrian woodworker, 1800s, a family woodworking shop, patented a process to bend birch wood using steam. So he locked down the IP, built factories across Eastern Europe, commissioned design of a high quality, and made this chair, a chair that was very easy to manufacture, to assemble, but also to disassemble. Now, what's important about this is 50 million of these chairs have been sold, and that doesn't include replicas, since it's an invention, it's idea. But most importantly, in the 1800s, this chair was unique because you could take 36 Thonet chairs and put them into a one meter cube box, which today you think, you know, one meter cube box. This is like in the 1800s. They didn't have like air freight or like all this stuff, and the horses freight, you know. So from a logistics perspective, it's a dream. It's an easy idea. From an IP perspective, they had locked an IP till, till the mid 1800s and they'd achieve scale and could, could protect more things. They had a good design at the same time. So these all three combined winning formula. And if you can recognize this, it's not dissimilar to the MacBook unibody. This is how smart design thinking, design business thinking is powered. And it's been like that for a long time. Now, people are often asking me, why should I care about this design thing? And I looked to understand this myself. So I went back into my own history, back when I was in the Shire, you know? <laughs> um, because uh, in fourth grade, uh, my parents went to my parent-teacher conference, and they could never go because we worked in the tofu store all the time. My parents could never leave work to go to parent-teacher conference. But just this one, they came. It was Mrs. Horita. She was the, uh, what do you call it, one of those like, uh, sort of like magnet, whatever, what do you call them, like, you know, new, whatever, you know, shaman-esque teacher, you know, kind of thing. And uh, Mrs. Horita uh, told my dad that John is good at math and art. You, you catch that stuff when you're a kid. You're like, yes, teacher said something good about me, right? Feels good. And then, when my dad was talking to a customer, he said, we went to school. She said, John is good at math. <laughs> and I always remember that. Like, whoa, dad, what happened to the words, you know? <laughs> and so, because that was the way he remembered it, I went to MIT. That was the family dream to one day, because my parents didn't go to high school, or college, they dreamed that we'd go to college someday, and there was only one college, actually two, MIT and Harvard. As the only ones that were in Seattle. We had no idea where these places were. I discovered that the M in MIT is from Massachusetts in 11th grade. <laughs> that was bad. But anyways, MIT, went to MIT, and you know, I did electrical engineering and computer science. I don't regret that at all, by the way, because it was a great grounding. And I went to art school after that. 
People ask me how I got to go to art school. It's because I finished my master's degree, and my dad said, well, now you can make a living. Do what you want to do. So I went to art school after that. Um, and I came back uh, in 1996 you know, to the Shire. You know, I was a new professor at the time, and it was 96, and it was that pre-dot-com boom. We you know it was a Pentium, Pentium Pro. Moore's Law was doing really good things, and new innovations were occurring. Things were moving into color screens, bigger screens. It was very exciting to be at the Media Lab. And uh, I'll never forget, I was at this, um, I'll never forget, in around 2000, this kind of, you know Lord of the Rings, like Mordor? The Mount Mordor moment happened. Darkness occurred. And I was so curious about this darkness. This darkness was, like, was happening. Uh, and what happened is I was in this faculty meeting and I remember Nicholas and a few other faculty, they had a lot of money, I think, and they were looking at their screens. During faculty meeting, that's a bad thing to do, by the way. But they're important. So there was all these screens of red numbers on them. And like, oh, 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 you know, whatever, oh, you know. It was the stock market was taking a nosedive and all their money was going away. I had no money. So I had no real, I don't know, what are they, what's wrong? I don't understand what's wrong. Um, and it's because it was that moment when the NASDAQ crashed in 2000. And it was a bad time. It was a bad time, you know? Everything was all dark, it was terrible, everything was happening for all kind of reasons. And I remember like getting through that, trying to understand that, to piece it together, what happened, you know? And to me, it's like that moment, you know, like in Lord of the Rings. You know, it's like a moment to battle kind of thing. And for South by Southwest yesterday, I was going to, like, sing. Like, theme for Lord of the Rings. It was a humming, but I, you know, I can't sing, you know. I wanted to find the theme, little theme piece. And then I thought I would find it online, you know, some, you know, download or whatever, but that could be copyright infringement. I don't know what to do. And just that day... Stanford University professor Gut Wong, who invented Smule. Do you know Smule? It's auto tuning technology. Uh, was visiting me. And he's, he designed an app to uh, play the iPhone like an ocarina. And so I outsourced the task to him. Build the mood. Good, huh? Come on, I gotta go away. I got it. That man. It's that moment, you know? Despair. Like, what do you do? And I was looking at the intersection of design and technology for most of my later academic life. I was curious about it. But this money thing bothered me because after this thing happened, there was a finance guy at MIT said to me, you're the creative guy, so don't worry about the money. This was the fifth time someone had told me that in my life. And I knew I better worry. <laughs> so what I did, because I realized I couldn't read newspapers with financial information. It just wasn't my thing. This bothered me. So I realized that I needed to change my, uh, my, my vector. And so I earned an MBA uh, through part-time education as a professor. Uh, because I was so curious about money and how it works as a medium and to be unafraid of it, you know? And uh, the story behind that perhaps is of, is of interest. Um, so I decided to do this MBA thing. I wasn't sure how to do it. I actually was going to apply to law school instead, but the MBA thing seemed kind of interesting for the, for the money. I wanted to understand this money thing. And uh, I spoke to one of the admin assistants at MIT who said that they had uh, applied for this uh, education grant. You know, part-time education, so if to learn and stuff. I thought, whoa, there's an employee benefit. I want to get that, you know? So I went to the HR office at MIT. 
And I said, hey, you know, can I apply for this thing? And, oh, you're a professor. You're a full professor. You don't need this. And I said, well, why not? Well, you're not like, you know, this is a benefit for people looking for the next sort of tier job or whatever, you know. And, and so he, said, gave me, he gave me this form, you know, and it said, like, and I, I wasn't sure, because, you know, like, if he stamps it or not, that's destiny. But I thought I would, like, hedge towards a win. So where it said, the next job you need for this education, I wrote down president of MIT. <laughs> Because I figured if, if, I, you know, if, if I didn't get it, I'd get them later. So I got it. So I did the MBA, and that was so useful to learn to be a consumer of education. It changed how I looked at teaching. It made me a better professor, I believe, because it made me interested in how people learn by being a learner, because it had been a long time since I had learned. Um, and also, I got over my fear of money. And what was great, in 2008, I read this book called The Audacity of Hope, and it was really exciting. And I wanted to do something more, and I got a call from Spencer Stewart, the recruiting agency, and asked if I wanted to be president of a college. And I had no experience at anything like that, you know? But the guy who wrote the book had no experience, too. So I thought, <laughs> why not? Maybe I can do it, too. So I, uh, I bought a book called The First 100 Days. Actually, not one book, three books. They were the first 90 days. These are books you buy if you're going to lead. Who's read a first 100-day book? First 90-day book? You know what I'm talking about? There we go, right? You buy those books. Those books say the following. As a leader, you should not have a vision. The vision should come from the people you lead. Every book, book one, book two, book three. And everyone I talked to on campus that I met, first question they asked, John, what's your vision? And I'm like, the book says I can't tell you what my vision is. <laughs> so it was hugely stressful. So, but I had this turning point, because I had this chance to address 600 students, high school students that had come to RISD to study over the summer. And I thought, whoa, this is perfect. So I wrote down on a paper four different things that I thought could be a vision. And so I showed up, and this was a really kind of a, you know, you guys are all well dressed and you look pretty, you won't hurt me. But green hair and like stuff, you know, fierceness, you know, youth too, body odor, everything. <laughs> it was strong. And a little scared. That, I was scared. That, Micah, that's when I was scared actually. Um, and um, and uh, I said, okay, I got the, I have these ideas for a vision. I'd like you to applaud for the one that you think I should go after. And that'll help get me some data. So the first one was uh, like lifelong art education. Oh, that didn't do very well at all. You know, so no, basically no applause. Some polite dad applause, but no, no applause. Second one was kind of about the ego, like about like the next generation of Damien Hirst. You know, like, ah, oh, next artist, you know. That was a little better, but didn't do very well. And I was about to give up, but I said this one thing, build a justifiable case for creativity in the world. And oh man, these students got so excited. I was like, whoa, yeah, I was like, what happened? You know, I, I wasn't sure why they were so excited. But an hour later, I was shopping in the alumni shop, and uh, a young woman came up to me and said, thank you for what you said in there. I said, what did I say? Because I didn't know what I said, actually. And uh, she said, well, I'm a sophomore in Nebraska, in high school in Nebraska, and I'm the creative one. I'm the weird one. No one takes me seriously. And you said up there, you will fight for us. And it all made sense. I said, this is what I must do. I must fight for this. Because at MIT, I was always fighting for creative people, but remember what the T stands for? Technology, right? So to be at RISD, to be close to pure creative, it got me in touch with this notion of just creative people writ large, like Professor Brandt's own sort of like, you know, this is the question. How do you fight for this? What, how does it work? That became my passion on behalf of those students in that audience. And so, I was at RISD for uh, over five years. 
I learned how to be a president in public. I think uh, I remember at my, you know, was it a, I remember I was probably the first president on Twitter, and I was visiting some college university president meeting where a couple Ivy League presidents came up to me and said, oh, we know you. You're the president on that Twitter thing. We're watching you because we're seeing if you'll fail. If you succeed, we might do it. I remember that. It was such a weird time, you know? And uh, I tried a lot of things out. Um, I remember, uh, is this interesting to you a little bit? Shall I go here a little bit? Thank you. Okay, I'll go there. I'll give you permission. Let's see if we're, you guys can charge the whole audience. Um, I remember like when I showed up, I heard about this great tradition of move-in day where all the cars line up and the students volunteer to move everyone's stuff in. And so I thought, that's awesome. So I showed up in a t-shirt and began moving things in. And this was, this was the cause of problem. People said, oh, you're not, you aren't supposed to be doing this. You're the president, you know? But what a better way to get data. I learned where all the parents were from. I learned who was relatives of whomever. I saw new relations being formed. I saw when we were slow in the supply chain for things moving around. I learned so much in that process. I learned everything in that process, really. And so I would do it every year. And every year, people would say to me, stop, because that is not presidential. You should be walking around in a suit and carrying a clipboard and, and uh, delegating. Uh, but I have to say, I had everyone there working. I wasn't doing all the work. The whole team was there. But I loved talking to the students and parents as they arrived, because I could understand why they made a choice to send their kids to the school. Um, and I remember um, uh, it was uh, four years later at commencement. Uh, when you're a president, you're wearing all kind of like fancy Ronald McDonald things. You know, like you can't tell who you are from far away. Uh, and so after commencement, you take it all off. You're like, you know, Clark Kent. And you sort of walk through. The, everyone's hugging and crying with balloons and flowers. And, there's a big escalator at the convention center that uh, we had rented. And so I got on the escalator on the fourth floor. I was incognito, so it was all cool. And the third floor, a young woman got in in full regalia. And she's sitting she's like next to me. She looks over to me and says, you're the president. And I said, yeah, you moved me in freshman year. And that was the kind of moment, you know, where you realize that any little thing you do does matter. It just takes time to find where the bottle went. And everything I did all made sense to me then. I'll never forget, I'll never forget the, um, the, uh, also that in year one, uh, all the applicants, the top 100 applicants that got in uh, received a letter. I asked for their phone numbers to call all of them. So I called 100 people. People said, oh, you can't do that. I said, well, let me try this out. So I called people, and of course, people thought I was a telemarketer <laughs> or like a robocall or something. I said, no, this is really me. It's really you. It's really me. And I tell you this because this was the transformative moment for me, just like in the auditorium of high school students understanding what to do. Because half to actually, no, it was 80% of the people that I called said they couldn't go to RISD because it was too expensive. And it was powerful to hear so many people tell me that we had no scholarship funding. And I remember um, I spoke to a mother. And she said in that voice, like a mom's voice, she's not home, but you better call in one hour. I said, yes, mom, I'm going to do that. <laughs> so I called up an hour later. And a young woman answered and said, you know, I've wanted to go to RISD since I was 11 years old. It's been my dream. I would go to campus every year. It was something you know, I wanted in my life. And I got in, I'm so happy, but I can't afford to go. And it was that moment I knew that this mattered. And so I gave my own scholarship to start a process to raise more funds for scholarship. So long story short, I was there for a little over five years increased scholarships, increased student leadership programs. I was focused on student development. And it was a great time of my life. And then in November of 2013, 
I got a call from two people. One person you know here, John Doerr, and another person with the same John D, John Donahoe, the CEO of eBay Incorporated, the holding company of eBay Marketplaces, PayPal, and GSI. And they were both asking me, hey, come out to Silicon Valley. This design thing is really hot. I said, that sounds great. When? Right now. I said, right now, right now? Right now. And I thought, well, it's November. I'm the president of a college. We don't leave. We have a long, you know, lady diet kind of thing. You know, we do this thing for a long time. So no, no, now. And I thought, when in my life would I get asked to go out to Silicon Valley to work with two John D's at the same time? <laughs> Those M. Night Shyamalan omen moments. <laughs> You know, I was like, I have to do this. So I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So I shot my own, own going away video. I made an iMovie and said, well, let's go. Because I had built a team that if I were hit by a bus, could run the place without me. That's how I built that institution to run. So uh, I showed up in January and arrived. And uh, I was from this, I had like a 16 room president's mansion, all that fancy stuff, whatever, which I never really was big on anyways. So now I live in Airbnbs and I UberX everywhere. I have no possessions. So I'm like an intellectual vagrant. And I'm experiencing life in a whole new way. It's quite exciting. And uh, I was in London in, in February or so and I got an email from Mary Meeker who invited me to make a image for her deck called the Internet Trends Deck on how user interface was changing. And I never heard of this deck. It's very influential, it's very important. But I said, well, that's great. I'm happy to add an image to that. And I looked backwards to all of our slide decks, which go back to 2001. And what was great to notice is that Mary is someone who foresaw the importance of investing in the technology industry, gave these reports annually to the analyst community, changed their perception of why it was important to invest in tech. And all of her reports pointed out that design was important. It was called different things. It was called user interface, experience, delight, all kinds of things. And so over multiple years, she described design. And so I thought it was useful to look at her decks look at the evolution of technology and make a case for creativity in the tech world with this deck. Because I was always interested in this change in the world that was described to me by the CEO of meetup.com, Scott Heiferman. And Scott was saying how <laughs> before the television, there was this like coffee table. Ever heard of this thing called a coffee table? It's crazy technology. You sit around it and talk to each, each other. I know, right? So there was the coffee table, and you'd sit around it before television was invented. And then after television was invented, you'd all be pointed towards the TV and experience it. And then after this thing called a personal computer, it was like right in your face. It was TV sitting at your face. And with laptops, everyone's TV is sitting at their face, right? And then. But the key change was this mobile thing. Mobile is basically you're walking around shining a TV in your face. <laughs> and not only just you, but everyone's walking around shining a TV in their face. That's this world. People say, oh my gosh, you know, the world's going to pot and so whatever. But this is the reality. This is what's happened. This is what we're doing right now. What does it mean? So what I thought about is, in the old days, you would maybe use the computer twice a day. Let's check some email. It's the morning. Let's check some email in the afternoon. If that experience was a bad experience, poorly designed, ouch in the morning, ouch in the evening. You can get over it. Bad design was OK then. But statistics are saying that people unlock their phone 150 times 
a day. It's roughly every five minutes. That's Android study of last year. Now, let me run that again because it's very important. You see you have, ouch, ouch. But then you have here, ouch. <laughs> It's not a pain point, it's a pain plane. If that design is not good, then you have a bad day, you start to dislike your experience. And when I look at all analyst reports, they all talk about number of users of the uh, internet. You know, now they say it's three billion users. You know, if you look at that curve, this is a linear curve, you know, ah, more, more, okay, it's getting there. We're increasing. But all the statistics miss the fact that people back here didn't use the computer as much as they use over here, right? It used to be like you use a little bit. Now it's shining in our face all the time. So if you take usage and multiply it by users, it looks more like this. This is the era we live in today. An era that we couldn't imagine in the 90s. It's at a scale that is truly alien and new, and it keeps on going. And so people say, well, this is the first time this has ever happened. It's not the first time. Larry Summers gives a great example. The former president of Harvard gives an example of when you talk about Clay Christensen's disruptive innovation idea. You know disruptive innovation? It's about a hard disk manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. He says, well, the first major disruptive innovation happened in the 1800s. In the 1800s, if you asked who was the best at manufacturing, the UK. They could make anything at any quantity, ship it anywhere. But they had steam-powered factories that were so ahead of any, any other country. And then late 1800s, Electricity begins to sort of percolate up. The British factories say, we don't need electricity. We have steam power. American factories had not grown at that stage and were able to adopt electricity sooner. So there you see disruptive innovation happening in the 1800s, 1900s. The same token, when we think about the computer and this users versus usage thing, I looked at the car industry. Because the car industry, uh, in the 1920s, what happens is uh, the car market was saturated. It was also the Depression era, but the 1920s, actually this is the rise of the, before the Depression. There was a, there was a, it was hard to sell cars around here. And Alfred P. Sloan uh, came up with this idea where he copied the bicycle industry of having this idea of changing the model every year, creating obsolescence, 1920s. But 1950s, car ownership was slowing down. And so what was important to note is that GM was the first company to have this position, vice president of design, because it realized that cars matured as a technology, and people were looking to define themselves with their cars. But not because of the car. It was because usage changed. Because Eisenhower had put in, President Eisenhower had put in the Federal Highway Act of 1952. That's basically the first Internet of Things. You know, things moving around the United States? It was the moment where cars became a way to enjoy the American life. Let's go drive to the Grand Canyon. Let's go to Yosemite. Let's go to Vermont. And so you suddenly were in the car a lot longer usage changed. So the car designs improved because you were, you were, they had to be more comfortable and you were saying something as an American, this is my car, this is who I am. Usage increased, uses increased. A similar phenomena, phenomena to the internet. You know, today, you can't imagine buying a car with no design, right? Here's a car, no design, you're gonna love it. You know, there's no cup holders, there's no seat, you know, to sit in, you can sit on the floor, you know, there's like a, a knob for the steering wheel, you know, no design. So it wouldn't happen, you wouldn't imagine it. But that's what happened in these last 20 years. We use technology 
that was poorly designed for people. It was designed for technologists, designed for speeding up technology. Only recently, because of that curve, we're all using it. And we, non-nerds, don't like stuff that doesn't feel right. So another question is, how do you become a designer in tech? And um, I was at one year at the World Economic Forum, and I loved when Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, said this phrase. He said, we're moving from capitalism to talentism. And to me, that validated what colleges and universities do. You know, we create talent, you create talent. It's the most vital thing. What is the best way to have a good university with great students? Because great professors want to be with great students. It's a symbiotic link. It is talentism at its finest. And so I thought about this talent thing and how it related to technology. And began to interview a bunch of people to ask them what is design. It turns out it's very hard to mine the data. So those, that, that data will come out <coughs> later in the year about what is design, what are the clusters around it. But did something tactical. Interviewed 110 designers across all the top companies, Apple, Google, uh, Netflix, LinkedIn, all the companies out there. Uh, did a study to interview them about the tech industry and learned a few things. I'll share with you some of them. Uh, sub subsequent reports will carry more of the data. But just as a footnote, this is Rochelle King. She is the vice president of design at Spotify. She was a art history major and then studied semiconductor physics, worked in a wafer plant for a while, uh, and uh, later on uh, became uh, a head of uh, design at a streaming music company. So talented engineer, talented art thinker, a combo person, not just an interdisciplinary person, but a multidisciplinary person. So it kind of underlies that all these people that we interviewed are all multi-people. They're happy being people across fields, uh, across fertilizers, agile thinkers in the tech industry. And what I was very happy to find is that you know, when you think of designer, you think that they went to design school. It turns out that in the tech industry, a third have engineering and science credentials. Why is that? It's because to understand how this technology works and design in it, those two knowledge bases are symbiotic. If you don't know how to take it apart, how to ask questions, how to talk to engineers, you won't make a better product. It's why I was speaking to architecture students uh, earlier today, how important it is to understand the code. Because if you don't understand how it exists, you can't understand its limitations. I remember I gave a talk in the 1990s at RISD, actually. Um, and um, it, was, it was the 1990s. I made a lot of things for the web. I made all kinds of things in Java. There was a time when I made Java things. And um, it wasn't very common at the time. But I made Java things for different companies, like Shiseido and Chanel and all kind of companies. I was, I was the, the web guy. Um, and, um, I was tired of this. So I, at the RISD lecture, I said, you know what? I'm stopping making things for the internet. You know? I'm stopping. It's tired. And then after the talk, a student came up to me and said, you know what? I don't really understand this web stuff. I'm going to be just like you and not do it. And I said, that's not, that's not what I said. I said, I understand it, and I'm stopping. You have to understand it to make a choice. And so it's so key to understand it for communication purposes, for your own advancement. If you refuse to understand it, I hope you're independently wealthy. If you're not, it's important. Oh, by the way, very important stat. I meet so many engineers who want to be in design. You can. I've seen them out there. I meet so many designers who want to understand engineering. You can. It's out there. I mean, so many designers who want to understand business, they're out there. Same with engineers. That's the world. It accepts you for being a multi-person. 
and then did a survey on Twitter. Roughly 370 people participated, senior, mid, junior level designers. 90, over 90% 90 said that coding is important. Now, I just fell over my chair when I saw this because in the 90s, I was the guy saying that coding was important for designers and artists. And I was laughed at like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You remember the new Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Claymation, misfit toys, made fun of, traumatic, 90s. And I remember, I, even, I was even like at this like uh, art opening in New York City. I was hanging out with some friends, you know, I'm at the dinner, I'm at this art opening, I'm sitting at a table. We're doing this sort of like introductions, you know, who are you, who are you, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm John, whatever. Guy stops dinner. You're John Maeda. I hate you. I said, why do you hate me? I don't even know who you are. Well, you think that this like programming coding thing is important in art. You are so wrong. Ouch. But anyways, years later, this is actually an accepted thing, which I find so exciting. Again, coding can be everything. You don't have to be a master software engineer, but you have to understand the medium. It's useful. It's critical. Today I met a young engineer here, Victoria, who is curious about how to learn about design. I just want to say, at a great university, it is like a great buffet. You have all the vegetables and meats all over the place. It's up to you to fill your plate. So if you're in engineering and you want to approach design, make a friend. Use your Starbucks gift card. That's what it's for. Same way in every direction. If you're in business, you want to understand design, use your Starbucks gift card as well. So connect in that way. It's such a key part of education that we so often miss opportunities to do. Because we like to stay in our bubble, we like to stay with our friends, and then we stop learning often. OK, so what's interesting is looking at business schools, because business schools are businesses. I'm not sure if you noticed that. They're very market oriented. They adapt very quickly, much, much faster than any other department in any, in, any, uh, in any institution. They're fast. And what was interesting is if you look at the number of, uh, this is an error, by the way, on that slide, but it's still the same. 70% of the top MBA schools, students have design clubs. So this is MBA students have design clubs in them. That's a crazy statistic. I, I realized it because I kept getting invited by student clubs at business schools, and I didn't realize it was a whole trend. What does it mean? It means that business leaders are seeing the, 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 the importance of design for them to learn it, because they have to work with designers. That's pretty new. So if you're in business school here or thinking of business, take a look at this as an important stat around design. Now, uh, Jackie Shu is a talent partner at Kleiner Perkins. I work with her. Uh, she has this LinkedIn post that's blown up. Uh, please uh, visit it more because she has such a talented young person. Um, first 10 hires must be all stars. And she was at uh, Facebook. She worked at Goldman first, and then at Facebook, and she was head of recruiting at Twitter. It's like a super young person, like hired like a thousand engineers. It's so inspiring person. And um, uh, she's been working with me to understand the design tech ecosystem. And she did a study where she found that in early stage startups, uh, early stage means they've raised less than $10 million, early, mid, and late. Um, uh, she found a ratio of one to four to one to five designers to engineers, which she found astounding. And people say, oh, well, why isn't it one designer to one engineer? What's wrong with that? Well, in reality, in reality, um, uh, startups never had designers. It might have been the 30th hire. So this is a super high ratio. And I was just at IBM Design this morning where their ratio was one to 64. And they are moving that from to one to eight. They have a whole design movement in that. It's amazing what they're doing there. And so people see this ratio as a critical thing. Also, what happens so often nowadays with startups is CEO, a CEO of an early stage startup, their first key hire is a designer. It's kind of an amazing time right now. But I want to note that in the same way there are good writers and crummy writers, good engineers, crummy engineers, I'm sure you've made a few, right? They're good, some of them are good, but some of them are not. So 
Same with designers. Good engine, good designers, crummy designers. And so it isn't a matter of getting any designer. It's common sense, but it's important to know just hiring a designer isn't going to make, make it all better. Recruiting their talent level is very important. And number two, being able to recruit a design leader is more important than recruiting a designer because startups scale. So someone who can lead, build a team, recruit is critical in the startup world. So if you want to work at a startup, make sure you uh, join some kind of leadership initiative that's available here. At the same time, it'll do you very well in later life. Um, and so I did take, I took two jobs last year. I would recommend that. It's a bit sort of challenging. I didn't realize it at first, but again, I could jump into things and make mistakes. So I was working at eBay for John Donahoe, the CEO. This is like thousands of people and across multiple continents and countries. And I was like, oh my gosh, I almost died the first four months. It was awesome. And uh, with uh, uh, John Donahoe and a team member, uh, worked on this idea of bringing a design to a large corporation instead of a startup, which you might think is impossible because it's already built. How do you make design important instead of a big company? So this is kind of a really an interesting experience that I had working with him because he felt design was important, didn't know how to make it important. And so the first question I asked him is, did he know any designers? Because design is done by designers. If you don't know designers, you get no design. And it turned out there were 380 designers on staff across all the countries. And so what I did with John is knit them together into a community. And did a lot of work to pull them together. And over the course of 12 months, brought together 380 designers to communicate with 1,000 executives to place design as a top priority of the eBay companies. And you'll see the results of that work over the next two years. And there's a Stanford Business School study being written about it. Now, final thoughts. So I talked about some old stuff. I talked about the chair. I talked about the GM thing. People say, why does it matter? It matters because I'm trying to show more audiences, more investors in this world that design is an old idea. Investors like to pattern match. They're common fast thinkers. So if they can see patterns, it builds trust. I got a few new ideas, like Apple, you know. I mean, Apple's the big thing. It's new. But it's not that new because I believe the combination of the new and the old, I call that the cloud, and this is the dirt. <laughs> and if you put the cloud and the dirt together, you get good. It isn't about the old. It isn't about the new. It's a combination creates new opportunities, such as designer co-founded startups that have done very well in the marketplace. And um, if you look at the Fortune 500, um, you look at number five, which is Apple, the only company with the SVP of design. Uh, but Apple is the o isn't the only company. Uh, all these companies have active design initiatives. Uh, that's 10% of the Fortune 125 have some form of executive support for design. And I'll be tracking this to see if it increases over the next few months. And I can see that the attention this report is gaining is exciting because the business community is taking watch of this. And it's just the tech community, and also the creative community. And also those people who are across are looking at this as an example of it has happened. And for those of you who remember the Sun workstation, if you don't know the Sun, the Sun was at the time the Ferrari of computing. Oh my god, you remember the Sun? Isn't it great? Little pizza boxes, it was really cool and fresh. Um, and uh, it was a workstation. Um, most people never touched a workstation in their entire life. It was designed for technical people. It was an engineering workstation. But I love when I visited Facebook's campus. The back of the Facebook campus, they, they, they moved to Sun's campus, Facebook, when they grew. The back of the Facebook sign looks like this. And the front looks like this. And it's so amazing because 
the leadership of Facebook recognized to keep the sign like that. So all the employees would know that Facebook could easily become like Sun, become irrelevant if, if it couldn't remember that it was consumer facing instead of tech facing because consumers care about design. So Facebook acquiring Hot Studio, acquiring design firms makes complete sense because they are the network for the world, including Instagram. That is the deck that is out. It's again released yesterday. It's on the Kleiner Perkins website. It made SlideShare number one uh, download, which is a good sign. It's a good sign for people's curiosity around these kinds of themes. And I hope it'll pique your own interest in these things as well. So that is my presentation. We can all go home and watch TV or something else. I want to watch House of Cards. I've watched all the episodes. You're nodding. And um, I, I want to thank you for the attention of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. John.